Hello, my friends. It's good to see you. It is a beautiful day outside. I had a great time on the street, gave away both the Bibles I had with me. It was good. I was there late, though, as I am here, because um, a wonderful young couple that I'd been studying the Bible with wanted to be baptized. And that took a little longer than I had expected, but it was glorious also. God is so good. There's another thing you might want to know. Um, call me or text me if you need to understand this more. But there is a uh, funeral at the Cremation Society on Franklin Gateway from 2 to 4 on Monday. That's tomorrow for Maritza. She's mother to Camilla and Argenis. And we've been praying for her for a long time. So uh, let's see, is there any other announcements I need to make? I don't think so. We're going to read from Matthew 13 again. This is our last one from Matthew 13. We're reading the unique, the parables that are unique to Matthew. And this one is the parable of the net. It's going to start at Matthew 13, verse 47 and go to verse 50. So let's pray before we read. Most Holy Father, we come to you asking for your guidance, your Holy Spirit's presence, and your wisdom as we read the Bible. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 13, 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind which when it was full, they drew to shore and cast and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew thirteen forty seven to 50. We are studying the parables that Matthew especially chose. Parables recorded by Matthew and no other gospel writer. Matthew 13 is a sermon or a discourse made up of seven parables of heaven's kingdom. These seven parables appear in two groups. In the first set, there is a longer parable with explanation and two very short parables, all teaching about astonishing growth in heaven's kingdom. These are found also in the records of the other three gospel writers. In the second set of parables in Matthew 13 are one longer parable with explanation and three very short parables, all unique to Matthew, that is, especially chosen by Matthew. It seems to me that the theme common to these four parables in Matthew 13 is inclusion or inclusivity. In the parable of the man sowing sorted grade A seed, the believer's project is to keep inclusion or inclusivity with respect now and let God do the sorting later. In the parable of the treasure, we discovered that some things had to be sorted and dropped away during an individualized quest to purchase the field with the treasure. In the parable of the merchant and his pearl, we learned further of the shaping of choice and values in which some values cannot be included with the highest values. Now another very short parable from Matthew 13. Heaven's kingdom is like a fishing net, which when thrown into the sea gathers a true sample of the population of the sea. When the net is full, they bring it in, sit down around it and sort the contents keeping the good and throwing away the bad. This is how it will be at the end. Angels will come and cut out the wicked from the just and throw them into the fire of a furnace. It will not go well for them. No mention was made at the first of any fisher people until the net is full and they bring it in. In Jesus' interpretation, they refers to the angels. I think I do not get to throw the net and bring it in full. There is no room for my hubris. 
I get to be one of those fish sitting next to one another, one who does not smell just like me. The net might represent simply the message of the kingdom being cast out over the population of the world. The parable seems to exclude any action of sorting until the end and by anyone but the angels. This means the fisher people do not sort them in the boat along the journey to the end. The net might represent any institution that can be used to gather people together. In that case, the mere time of day or of the centuries might be considered as a kind of sorting. Yet, whatever was in the sea at that moment is brought in and sorted only at the end. Two observation about inclusion and inclusivity seem important here. The first is that our job is inclusion and inclusivity without sorting, including whatever comes up without thought to their goodness or badness. Only in the end will the angels identify the good and the bad. The second observation about inclusion and inclusivity is that God has a different mandate at the end than humans have in the meantime. This is the same observation as seems required from the first parable in this set of the wheat and the enemy sown weeds growing together until the sort at the time of the harvest. There is a time of sort and throw away. There is an exclusion that fits within God's plan for an inclusion that is fair. Whatever our cries for inclusion or against exclusion, I choose to trust that God has a plan to make everything just and fair in the end. That is why there is no ever-burning hell right now or in the future. That is what I said. No ever-burning hell, either now or ever. Let us back up a bit and firm up our logic. First point of logic. God is neither pleased with nor willing for the death of any human. Second point of logic, God sent his son Jesus on an imaginably costly mission to save humans from death. Third point of logic, humans die. That fact is the fault of God's enemy who lured the first two humans away from trust in God. And since God is the only source of life in the universe, these first two humans effectively chose against life for all their descendants. They chose death for us. We will talk about death a bit today. We will approach the topic from an angle different from what you may be used to. Hold on, we will return presently to the affirmation that God has no pleasure in the death of anyone. Now, in response to the choice of death made by those first two humans, God arranged for an intermediate state where after repentance and a lifetime of care, the first two could rest while the centuries went by. The extended time was present to allow every one of their descendants to make that choice for him or herself. Though people have come to call this intermediate state death, Jesus called it sleep. The Old Testament chroniclers called it sleep, recording that each king slept and was buried. Old Testament wisdom knew that the grave was like a sleep, a rest unconscious of happenings anywhere in the universe. 
In response to the choice of death by the first two humans, God devised an intermediate state in which they and their children can wait while all their descendants have time to repent and make the choice for God. Yes, people die. And Jesus weeps with us in our loss. Paul wrote that we should comfort one another with the recognition that this death is not forever because Jesus will return and wake them all from sleep. This sleep while trusting Jesus is not a bad place to be. The death to be feared is the final death, which is awarded to each person according to individual choice during life on earth. By the way, this death to be feared is really cessation of life, not just some change of life form that can withstand great heat to burn forever in hell. In the parable that gave rise to my monologue on death, those who are thrown into the furnace of fire experience common human symptoms of anxiety, grief, and extreme pain for a short while until the fire does its work. There's nothing said about living on and on in torment. For all these reasons, we now use the word death for two different situations. The double meaning of one word is the realm of punsters and of manipulative propaganda. The serpent in the tree told Eve, you will not die. He told a lie in both meanings of the word. Now he insinuates that people in the waiting space of sleep can be contacted in another realm. They did not die, he says. He insinuates also that the final death is not death at all. They will live forever in the fire, he says. His lie lives on. However, this is about Satan, but our initial question in this study had to do with God, not Satan. Remember, we found that God has neither pleasure nor willingness for the death of anyone. God is not stoking the fires of hell with a big grin, nor is he letting the devil do it. Not thinking of the pleasure it will bring God and God worshipers to be able to watch forever their erstwhile tormentors being tormented. No, absolutely no. Sometimes we think it would be fair for God to vaporize his enemy, the serpent, the devil, and do it right now or even centuries ago. However, God wants people. That's right. God created human beings because he wanted humans with whom to converse and build friendships and partnerships. For this reason, God let the choices and the necessary time play themselves out with the knowledge of God's own determination to make all things right one day, to even up the score for all the bullying and shaming that have happened here on earth. Let us conclude then that God is a God of inclusion and wants us to operate with inclusion. Yet, when the time is right, God will let those who have chosen against trust in the goodness of God, God will let them have their way, death. Their hubris will consume them, and the meek, the humble, will inhabit the earth. The sort must come from God with surpassing wisdom and with justice for all. He will oversee the sort. I will remind you of an Old Testament story that likely lay in the memories of Jesus' first hearers and gave them a background for the understanding of Jesus' parable. It's a beautiful day, but the pollen is yellow all over. 
All right, this is an Old Testament story. Daniel was not invited to the party. Daniel had come to Babylon as a youth and now he was old. The empire of Babylon had taken over the world and in the process had burned Jerusalem with its beautiful temple. Babylon had taken some of the best youth to be trained to work in the interest of the kingdom. Daniel trusted God, worked hard, and became trusted and honored by many all over the land. Daniel was not invited to the party. The party was hosted by King Belshazzar with all his lords and nobles in attendance, except Daniel. The party was a hubris party because the city was under siege by the kingdom who would soon become the next world empire, the Medes and Persians. They, these Babylonians celebrated the impregnability of their city. Their walls were so thick that traffic on top could proceed like modern interstate highways. Their food was stored to last a long time. Their water was sure with the Euphrates River running through the city. They thought they were secure and they celebrated while acclaiming themselves. For further hubris, Belshazzar commanded that the golden goblets and utensils that had been stolen from Jerusalem and God's temple must be brought to the table and used in toasts to themselves and each other. But there is a last night. There is an end to living by hubris. In the midst of the hubris, in the midst of the hubris party came the famous handwriting on the wall. That's a true story. The king had to send for Daniel to interpret it. When he arrived, Daniel reminded the king of the sins of his father, historically his grandfather, and carried on by the son. There was pride and arrogance with no willingness to humble himself before the God of heaven whom his father had come to respect. Of course, this kind of hubris brought all sorts of oppression of the poor and outcast. Well, Daniel announced an end to this hubris. That very moment, the armies were marching right into the city. They had diverted the great Euphrates and marched in under the walls in the riverbed. Someone had neglected to shut the gates under the wall. Babylon ended that night. The king died. God had called it with the handwriting on the wall. The king's grandfather had called it years before by writing for all posterity, the God of heaven is able to bring down those who live in pride. As with the fish brought in by the net, as with the harvest in the field, there is a sort an end to hubris, a last night that cuts short the party. Though God urges inclusion and inclusivity as our stance in this world, there will come a time when God steps in to sort out those who have hurt and shamed others, those whose arrogance stood against God and thus against life. The parable of the net shapes our ideas of inclusion and inclusivity. We do not have to be controlled by the spirit of vengeance, but can focus on love toward all during our lifetime here, knowing that God will do the justice in God's own time. At that time, the justice will be so just that everyone will agree that it is justice for all. So far, the first and fourth parables, the sower of grade A seed and the net, insist on inclusion and inclusivity with love and no room for vengeance, love of those with whom we find ourselves. The second and third parables, the treasure and the merchant, color and shape the idea of inclusion and inc inclusivity to insist that some things will be left out of our focus as we find in Jesus our joy and give up 
all for him. Well, I want to pray for us. Join me if you will. Our Father, you are in heaven. We honor you and praise you. We want your kingdom to come on earth. We ask for your will to be done. We also ask for your forgiveness for the times when we have not done as we should, times when we have let our focus slip from you. And we thank you for that forgiveness because we believe you bought it on Calvary for us. We believe we're walking free now to where when you look at us, you see Jesus. We thank you for this. This is such liberation. We honor you and glorify your uh, way of doing things around the world. So now, Lord, we have requests that we want you to hear. We, we pull them out of on our paper or in the depths of our hearts and heads. You know what our requests are. We, we name some folk before you right now. Someone whose name starts with N and someone whose name starts with C and another C and, and an A. Um, Lord, we ask your presence with a, a D and just so many hearts that are hurting right now. Um, We ask for your comfort for them. If there are folk among my friends who are lacking resources or um, ill, recovering, or greatly depressed or afraid of something, my God, I trust that you will work hard for these, that you will be close to them, close to anyone who's suffering. Our hearts go out to the families of those who died on the bridge a few days ago. And our hearts go out to any who have suffered an accident that was life-changing. You, Lord, know how to deal with such. We ask for your blessing as we go from here. And we thank you that you have heard our prayer and that you are at work. So because we've prayed in Jesus' name, we give you all the dominion, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm Wilma Zalabach. I'm with Grace Chapel Fellowship. Grace Chapel Fellowship is a church to bless other churches where listening is our um, unity. So there are six uh, themes that usually come to the forefront in what I do. One, God is good. Two, humans have to been taken away from good. Three, Jesus came to bring us back. And four, I can't do it, but God can. And I decide to let God. Five. The Bible is worth reading. Six, the Sabbath is a gift worth remembering. So now, until next week, oh, let me remind you, you can uh, subscribe to this channel. You can like this video. You can write a, um, a comment. You can share this video. You know, everything you do, each one of those helps our algorithms so that other people can see it too. Thank you. May the Lord bless you and keep you.